It never ceases to amaze me that when somebody discovers religion or embarks on a spiritual journey, then suddenly their IQ drops by about 50 points. The question is, why does religion make us stupid? Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying religion is stupid. I'm saying that the way we practice religion and the spiritual path is a bit daft. I mean, we all went to school, right? We studied mathematics and science. We studied history. We learnt how institutionalized religions manipulated and deceived the masses, all for the sake of further enriching an elite group of greedy and powerful men. But for some reason, the first time we go down to the Tibetan temple or the Hindu ashram, then all of this knowledge goes out the window. It's as if we're ready to accept whatever we're spoon-fed without questioning it for ourselves. We just swallow the whole thing hook, line and sinker. Now I'm not saying that faith is a bad thing. Faith is a good thing, especially informed faith. That's the faith that arises out of having understood the positive qualities of the teacher and the teachings. But also blind faith is quite useful. We need a certain amount of blind faith. For example, most people have faith in science. But it's not like we understand the profound meaning of the modern scientific paradigm. In fact, there's a lot of things we're not clear about. For example, string theory and quantum mechanics. But we kind of believe it's true. That's partially because we can see the obvious advantages of scientific development. I mean, most of us use computers and iPhones and those sort of things. And we know that these things were developed by scientists. But there is a very strange trend these days. Many people no longer have faith in science or medicine. And the reason why they don't have faith in science or medicine is because they have blind faith in something else. And that is in conspiracy theorists and influencers on the internet. In general, then these influencers are not themselves educated in the topics that they discuss, but they have a lot of opinions and spread a lot of disinformation and conspiracies. Like Tucker Carlson, for example. I mean, everybody knows of Donald J. Trump, who's running to be the President of the United States of America. And basically, almost everything he says is a complete lie. But there are millions and millions of people in the United States of America who believe everything he says. And not only that, they seem to be some kind of messiah. But I'm not here to talk about politics. This is not my field of expertise. In general, it is thought that if you have 10,000 hours of experience in a particular field, then you are considered an expert. And in four years in retreat, then I spent over 20,000 hours meditating. But in terms of meditation, then the amount of hours that you've spent meditating is beside the point. It's all about understanding, experience and realization. Anyway, the spiritual path and meditation is something that I am confident I can discuss with some authority. So the question is, why do we fall into this trap? Why is it when we come to the spiritual path that all our logic and reasoning goes out the window? Well, partially, this is down to our herd mentality. We have a strong sense of tribalism. So when we come to the temple and everybody is prostrating to an idol or to a teacher, then we don't want to be the one who isn't doing it. We don't want to be seen different or not to be joining in. Now this is a big danger in spiritual communities because this is the mechanism by which people eventually suffer from institutional abuse. And this is something that almost everyone is familiar with these days. There's a lot of controversy, not only in Tibetan Buddhism, but also in other spiritual traditions. In fact, there are many extremely negative spiritual cults. But thankfully, these are the minority. Still, without being an actual cult, then there's a lot of negativity that goes on in spiritual communities. But it isn't as if the fault lies only with the teachers or the institutional leaders. 
In fact, we are complicit in this. And part of the reason why we get in trouble is because we have this blind faith. We don't question what we're taught. And primarily, we don't tend to check out our teachers before we hand over our freedom to them. People are all too eager to pledge their loyalty to the teacher and the community without first investigating for themselves whether or not the teachings and the teacher are authentic. And this is the first step that everyone needs to do when they come to the spiritual path. But we don't do that. We get kind of carried away and then we just show up in a temple and we just follow along with what everyone else is doing. That's not the way to go about it. And the consequence of this is that many people suffer institutional abuse in spiritual communities. They give over their freedom to the teacher without first checking out if that teacher has compassion. So what you need to do is you need to get smart about it. And also, whatever you do, don't drink the Kool-Aid. But this isn't really a laughing matter. In general, what happens is we follow along with the spiritual tradition and then when something goes wrong, we point the finger at the teacher or we try to blame the institution for normalizing abusive behavior. Both the teacher and the students are responsible for the outcomes of their interaction. Part of the reason why we get into trouble is because we're all too eager when we first embark on a spiritual journey. As I said, we show up to the temple and then we just bow down to the teacher. We subjugate ourselves to the teacher. And then there is this tradition of offering our money and services to the Dharma Center. Now this itself is not a negative thing. The teacher has a responsibility to work for the benefit of the student, but it's not guaranteed that that teacher will be doing that. The problem is that we think automatically that if there's a spiritual teacher that they have spiritual qualities, and this is not the case. In fact, most spiritual teachers do not have any spiritual qualities. They're just ordinary beings. And what it means to be an ordinary human being is that one is under the sway of one's afflictions, one's negative emotions. As long as you remain an ordinary being, then there's always the chance that you're going to be corrupted. You'll be corrupted by power and wealth and status. And this is often what happens. The teachers themselves might have good intentions. They may wish to spread the Dharma and to help others progress on the spiritual path. But for us, the first thought that comes to mind is that we need to give them lots of money. We need to turn our teacher into some kind of king or emperor. They become like oligarchs. And what you have to understand is that many of these teachers themselves come from poor backgrounds. They might come from a little village high in the Himalayan mountains. They may have been brought up without a lot of wealth and without a lot of possessions. And more likely than not, they've spent most of their time living in a monastery, living a simple life. And when they come to West, then they get treated like kings. And suddenly they have a lot of money that they don't know what to do with. Initially, they might think to build a statue or to build a temple. Eventually, there is a great likelihood that they will become corrupted by their wealth. This is a point that my own teacher makes often. He says to the students that they spoil the lamas because all they want to do is make offerings. They want to give them luxury goods like iPhones and cars and gold and silver. And it's not certain that these monks themselves have any spiritual practice. Like I said, they may have grown up in a very simple environment. They've not really been exposed to the West. But when they come to the West, then they become spoiled. Not only are they living a relative life of luxury, but compared to most Westerners, they're actually quite rich. If you look at the authentic masters of the past, let's take Patro Rinpoche, for example. Then any time anyone tried to give him some money, he would just throw it away. He had no interest in wealth. The king of Bhaktapur invited Milarepa to a feast. He wanted to honor him and lavish him with fine offerings. But Milarepa had no interest in this. Not only that, he was actually afraid of it because he knew that for an authentic spiritual practitioner, fame, fortune, wealth, and status are like poison. As soon as you become concerned with worldly comforts and sense pleasures, then your spiritual practice is over. It corrupts you. You become radicalized. It is taught that chasing after your desire is like drinking salt water. And so naturally, somebody who doesn't have spiritual practice or even somebody with a little bit of spiritual practice, once they start enjoying the pleasures of the world, are going to want more. And this is what happens to many teachers. As I said, initially they may want to build a temple or to build a statue, but eventually they have so much money they don't know what to do with it. And then they start getting all sorts of ideas. And just because you're a monk, it doesn't mean that you've overcome your mind poisons. Monks and nuns are basically like everyone else. They have desire, anger, and ignorance. 
And once you start putting someone up on a high throne and treating them like a king, then it's almost certain, unless they have some level of spiritual practice, that they're going to get corrupted. They're going to be spoiled. But this is not the way of a spiritual practitioner. An authentic spiritual practitioner is someone who is humble and lives a simple life. Also, they should have strong love and compassion for others. If you're looking for a teacher, you need to at least find one that has two qualities. That is, they should be at least in some way learned. They should have something to teach, not just to repeat the trite statements you hear all the time in the spiritual path. They have to be learned, but they also have to have compassion. That means they will work for your benefit. Sadly, many teachers out there are only trying to enrich themselves. They're using their students as a means to elevate their own status in the global spiritual community. This is something I have personally witnessed myself and I've mentioned on previous videos. And the reason why we fall into these traps is because we are still ordinary beings. We have not conquered our negative emotions. And as long as we haven't conquered our negative emotions, then we are always going to be susceptible to corruption. We become stupid when we enter the spiritual path. We think that just because it has the label of religion or spirituality, then it will be different. It's the same when it comes to politicians, billionaires and oligarchs. Everybody is saying that what they're doing is for the benefit of others. They're trying to save the world. But the reality is, we just tell ourselves these sorts of things. We tell ourselves these sorts of things to justify getting what we want. But it's not like all spiritual teachers are like this. There are authentic spiritual practitioners and teachers in the world. But the truth is, we seldom meet these individuals. And that's because they're usually off in the wilderness somewhere meditating. They are not the sort of people who will go jet-setting around the world collecting money for their organization. And this is something you need to be aware of. And this is part of the reason why religion makes us stupid. It's because we see our spiritual teachers somehow to be like rock stars, like Sadhguru or something like that. But that is not the way that an authentic spiritual practitioner will appear to us. An authentic spiritual practitioner has a strong aversion to worldly activities. Let's take Milarepa for example. He would travel alone in the wilderness, meditating in caves and in forests. And when people started to show up, Milarepa didn't think, well, it's great, now I can start a Dharma center and spread the word around the world. What he did was he ran away. He would disappear in the night. In general, there's two types of spiritual forbearance. One is forbearing the obstacles that arise, the difficulties of practice. For example, being cold, not having food, not having money. But there is another type of forbearance, and that is the forbearance of the good things. Being able to forbear the compliments and the offerings that others give you. And as you know, then I never ask for money. In fact, I don't want your money. I'm afraid of it. If people start giving me lots of money, then I'm going to get all sorts of ideas, and this will become an obstacle to my spiritual path. And there's another thing to consider. Although at first, you might be quite happy to give me some money, let's say to build a retreat center. But in the future, if things don't turn out as planned, it's quite likely that you will give rise to regret. You might also get angry. This is often what happens in spiritual communities. So let's say you're one of these spiritual teachers, you beg $2 million off of your students, and after five or six years of trying to establish the center, everything goes wrong and you lose all the money. People are gonna be unhappy. I'd rather not get involved in that kind of situation. So for my part, what I'm going to do is try to do whatever I can. Try to do whatever I can as much as possible on my own. What you need to know is it's very difficult to bring benefit on the spiritual path. It's very difficult to benefit another. The best way to do that is through teaching because it is through hearing the sublime Dharma that one is able to change one's mind. And it is this changing of one's mind that leads to progress on the spiritual path. And it is my sincere wish that you should progress on the spiritual path and eventually achieve final awakening and liberation from the mundane world. And because of that, I'm willing to put my own time and effort into the endeavor and also to share what little I've learned from an authentic spiritual practitioner and meditation teacher. So until next time, and see you later.